accompanied by Corona. And how about Lou Will? You're going to win six man of the year. It says two time. You can probably put 2019 in there. I don't know who, who would be better. I mean, it's amazing what he has done. All time leading scorer off the bench in the NBA. But it's also an amazing story how he got from A to B as we look at the rise of Lou Will. He was legendary. I walked into an open gym when he was in high school, and he was a little bit late. He walked in and said, check ball, and killed everybody. He made uh, the most unbelievably quick move I've ever seen in my life. Oh, and uh, remind me so much of myself. He was built for the fourth quarter. Pro's professional score. The all-time leader off the bench in point score. The best in the history of the game. My man right here is an all-star. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm happy I stuck around long enough for people to kind of appreciate what I bring to the table. The I didn't come in thinking I was going to play right away. I was a 17 year old kid. Um, and once you survey the scene, you obviously recognize early on that there's a superstar in front of you in this position that you watch and you idolize everything that they do. This ain't no real game, man. What? I ain't never seen you score in no real game. Go get. He was receptive to it all with guys like us that come in with raw ability is, you know, getting the mental part of everything. Hey, uh, took me out of here. Bro, don't look at the mistakes I make. I want you to be better than what I am. Over time, when we developed a relationship, that's when it became more of a mentor um, and a mentee where I would start watching things. He would show me things. He would talk about things. He looked up to me. He knew how much I cared about him. It was easy for him. To, to listen to me, because he knew I wasn't telling him anything wrong, telling him anything to hurt. He probably wanted me to get the full AI experience, you know what I'm saying? And that's what we did. I seen, seen a lot with my man, so yeah. Being in your 12th year, you know, a pretty successful run, you like, you know, maybe it's the game changing on me. He could easily gave up. You know, my conversation with him, I said, hey, man, you know, this one you, Stamp your pages now. I told him from day one when he got here, I said, you're gonna love playing for Doc Rivers. Sat down with Doc, and he was like, I don't know what they thinking, but this home, so you can get comfortable being here. The sixth man of the NBA season. Oh, Lou Williams. Shoots for the win. Oh. It's an honor to receive this award tonight. I want to thank the Clippers organization for giving me an opportunity to be myself, allow me to go out on the floor, do my thing. I remember writing, oh, Lou will, Lou will never have a season like he had last year again. That was a one-time only thing, and that's uh, incorrect. Lou will fire the three. Bingo! Lou Williams! He's the ultimate starter off the bench. <laughs> He's proven Dallas wrong consistently, year after year. And it's funny, the older he gets, the better he gets for some odd reason. Lou's having one of the best seasons off the bench in NBA history. Lou Williams, oh, man, it goes slammed up! Oh, three oh, Got to his left, fires a score. He's amazing. I mean, he's absolutely amazing. He doesn't shy away from the big moment. Wants to be in that moment. Wants the shot at the end. Williams, good! What a shot! Lay it up. That should be enough to make him the highest scoring bench player in so. the history of the NBA. The 14th years, I'm not shying away from the attention, you know, make, make some noise for me this time around because I've had plenty of years where nobody cared. It's about time that he's uh, given the recognition and uh, basically the honor that he definitely deserves. There's no way you can sit here and say any other name as six man of the year. Being the go-to guy off the bench is it's almost an unprecedented in NBA history. He always had the physical ability, but you can tell, you know, where his mind is at. He wanted to be more than average. And ultimately, you know, here we are today. Clippers bring it in. Five seconds to go. Tie game. Seat belts are fastened. Lou Williams for the win. Bingo! Oh my goodness. <laughs> that just happened. I came from nothing, basically, in my career. You know, it's something until, and then it grows, and then it grows. Pass it around the room until Lou gets it, all right? Pass it around the room until Lou gets it. Yes, sir. Having an opportunity to win another six-man, having an opportunity to go to the playoffs with this team, 
I'll embrace this one. Should be a good one coming up in a great atmosphere at Staples for game number four coming up later this afternoon as part of the call of that. Of course, our own Kristen Ledlow joins us down on the phone. Uh, Kristen, uh, Lou has uh, made quite a statement over the course of the last number of seasons for his scoring, but he also brings a lot of leadership to this team. How much does that become a factor after the statement that was made and the dominant statement from the Warriors in game number three? And you know what's funny is I sat down with Lou just a couple of days ago, and as we were getting up, I thought it's safe to let him know that he got my sixth man of the year award vote. And he looked at me and said, well, yeah, it was kind of a no-brainer this season, right? <laughs> I said, okay, well, at least maybe now he'll know it's unanimous. I think that what Lou brings to this team is this unrivaled belief that they can actually not just compete with but beat the defending champion warriors and because he brings that belief to the table uh, the rest of the team goes out there with that same unrivaled belief and a lot of times we hear these players they either sit down with us or sit down at a podium and say well yeah we want to play with the best in the world but there's something about it that you're not really buying when you sit down and talk to lou williams he actually believes that they can. And he reminded me of a week in February where they came back from down more than 20 points, three games, three different times in a week's span. And he said, there's something about this team that does not stop playing until the final buzzer. And because he goes out there and plays that way, the rest of the team is playing that way as well. Uh, Kristen, uh, for those like you and I in TV, we were uh, happy that KD ID'd himself a couple of days ago and saying, I'm Kevin Durant, just in case you know the folks upstairs didn't know to make sure they had that lower third bug correct. And then he went and showed uh, Pat Bev and company what he could do. He was way more demonstrative. I know, obviously, Coach Kerr wanted to see that. Uh, what was kind of the reaction afterwards and the aftermath, really from both sides, on the statement that was made from KD on that floor in game number three? Well... I think the most memorable reaction was from Patrick Beverly because it has been his matchup with Kevin Durant in these first three games that has not just been the ongoing narrative, but really the headline, the one to watch. You know, he's been sent out there to try and not just slow Kevin down, but to get in his head. It's one of the things that we heard Doc Rivers say in the fourth quarter of game two before Patrick fouled out, stay in KD's head, stay in KD's head. So I think his response to recognizing that Kevin could just have decided at any point to start scoring that way um, seemed to be discouraging in a sense, but also encouraging in that, okay, now I know how I can defend him better. Uh, but I do know before the game, Coach Kerr was talking to us and he said, you know, you want Kevin to go out there and score like the most skilled basketball player in the world that he is. So we're hoping that he shoots more than seven times. We want him to shoot more than seven times. You told him, go out there and shoot more than seven times. And sure enough, he went out there and, and made the statement that he did. But when I talked to him after the game, Kevin was pretty simple in his answer that I wake up every day and I get to play in this beautiful league and winning is just the cherry on top. So he seems to see it as simply second nature. Well, uh, I wouldn't want to have uh, Smitty posting me up in the block either. So, uh, <laughs> Pat Bev doing the best that he can. Chris, we always appreciate it. Looking forward to the coverage and the broadcast this afternoon. Thanks so much. Thank you. There's uh, Chris and Ledlow joining us. So, let, let's get to, we'll, we'll break down the Warriors plenty as we get closer to that matchup. But I want to go to the Clippers. And, uh, Coach, when Tobias Harris was moved, it was seemingly like the 900th time that Doc and his group were supposed to go away. They never go away. Somebody who knows how tough it is to kind of get everybody on the same page. What's impressed you most about what this team and this culture has presented itself for here this season? Well, I think the job that Doc did with the team to sell them on the belief that they could win. And, uh, and it probably starts with Lou Williams. Uh, he's embraced uh, coming off the bench. He stars in his role. I think that helped Montrez Harrell accept his role. And when you play against the Clippers, you better have a game plan for their second unit. And when you mentioned those comebacks that they had when they were down big, well, when their bench comes in, they get better, a lot better. And so I think a guy like Lou Williams, you have to have a specific game plan for him. 
Uh, and his game has really grown. And if you can recall, when he came in, he was more of a mid-range shooter. Now that he's got great economy of motion. He gets to all the spots he wants to get to. He shoots the three. He's a great finisher. Uh, he puts enormous pressure on your defense at all times. So I'd say the, the bench play and what Doc has done with that team and they're positioned, obviously, great going forward for the future. You know, one thing that we saw Smitty in, it is a different story in the playoffs, but you and I did a couple of Clipper games this year. Gallo was, re- the whole first unit really went through Gallinari. And for those who didn't watch, I think we were reinstated to the belief of when he's healthy, forget just shooting threes, what he can do. But it was creating a lot of open threes for Shamit, who can knock him down, and Beverly and others. How important is it that that first unit finds some sort of success if they're going to have a chance to battle back? Because it can't always be about Lou Will and Montrezl Harrell. Well, Casey, I mean, their first unit is going against the Golden State Warriors' first unit. That, that's tough against anybody in this league. So it's going to be hard for those guys. I think for Gallinari, just find a way to take high percentage shots. Don't let them bait you to taking you know these shots where we can't get back and have our defensive balance. You can't ask this first unit to just outplay the first unit of the Golden State Warriors. It's got to be collectively. And I think Gallinari has to come back and have an impact on this game other than just scoring. We know he can score, but I don't think they're gonna, that first unit is going to never outplay the Golden State's first unit. Collectively, the Clippers going to have to get it done and, and rely on guys to keep it close. And Lou Williams, Montrezl Harrell, if it's close, they have two guys that can win the game as well down the stretch. I don't think there's anybody from coach or GM or anybody else who wouldn't want Pat Bev on their team. And I'm sure he would take Wilt backing him into the post <laughs> and be fine. But do they need to have, and is there some adjustment they can make defensively to try and switch things up a little bit on KD after what they saw in Game 3? I mean, you can, but you, what, what do you do? You throw a zone at him, or do you throw some length at him and he's too quick and capable to you know, utilize the angles to get to his sweet spots? And then I think your best bet you know, playing with KD and the things that he had problems with is guys like Tony Allen. You know, someone that can crowd him, stay with him, uh, get into him, be a little physical with him, and make it difficult. But you're not going to block a shot. The, your best bet is to make it uncomfortable and just try to, you know, corral him as much as possible. But he's a bona fide scorer, one of the best we've ever seen in this game. To quote uh, Dumb and Dumber, so you're saying there's a chance? No. No. Okay. We're gonna let, <laughs> you're the one who told me whatever I think I can't. You in this case, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. Uh, we got a lot coming up on the other side. We continue here on Game Time. Quadruple header of action. Jalen Brown was enormous in game number three to put the Celtics one away and the Pacers on a break. We got more. Get you ready for tip of that one here on Game Time. Don't move. For Russell Westbrook, it was an entertaining game in the last one of this series that saw Oklahoma City get back down to 2-1, including rocking babies and bumping off Dame and doing the same. Now, Dame did give him 25 in the third quarter, but at the end of the fourth, it was this big shot that helped put things to rest and one big dunk from Paul George that helped more conversation come. That in a second. In the meantime, from a head-to-head standpoint, uh, we could tell... There is a, maybe mutual respect from a standpoint of what they do on the floor, but not a general liking of each other, which makes it fun for all of us to actually see rivalries here in 2019. With more on that and a preview on what's coming up in game number four, here's Stephanie Ray. It's well known in the playoffs that the team that makes the best adjustments generally has the most success. Paul George on Saturday admitted that he was not taking advantage of what the defense was giving him. He said he was doing too much. He says that he can make it easier on himself. Well, George and the Thunder have no intentions of making it easier for the Blazers. They're not perfect. Uh, they're subject to throw the, turn the ball over sometimes. Um, we just got to make it as tough as possible as we can. Um, they're going to make shots, as you saw Dane get hot in the third. They're going to they're gonna be special, but um, we, we got to try to speed them up, um, force them into what we want them to do, and uh, live with the results. But make no mistake, it's not only the adjustments we have our eyes on, but also the battle of the point guards. It's just that there are two people fighting out there. And uh, obviously, I think, you know, the Davis doing a really good, he's doing a really good job just keeping his calmness because that's Russell's game. He's going to yell, he's going to scream, he's going to get under your skin. But I think Dame is doing an amazing job. Just keep, Dame and CJ keeping their uh, coolness and calmness. Yeah, he's not going to get under my skin. People don't get under my skin because I'm just not, it's just not going to happen. I wasn't raised that way. 
I, I, I grew up around a lot of stuff that could have got under my skin more than trash talk or a basketball game. So it's just, it's just not going to happen. Uh, it's hard not to love. Uh, I, hey, look, and I know you love competition and competing and all that. You should have seen the pep talk I got in private during the brand. I got to talk about it. I survived, though. We're good. <laughs> uh, but I, I love that back and forth. Seemed to kind of elevate both players. How about the one-on-one that you've seen here between Russ and Damon this season? Yeah, I think, you know, as fans, when you're watching it, you can't ask for anything better. We all love to see great competition. you got two great talents. You have two great teams. Uh, and what's happened, I think, in this series, uh, Portland's very good at home, and so it, OKC is very good at home. And so it's changed. Now, the role players have to play well. But, uh, OKC's bench has to step up. But that, that matchup, and they got to be careful not to allow it to become too much one-on-one. But the thing about Russ is he plays off his emotion. You never want to take that away from him. him. That's, what, that's what makes him so special. And Dame, does, he doesn't get rattled. So they're both great in their own way, and they're both a little different. Uh, Russ is, uh, is going to attack you more in his size. He's tough to stop. And Dame, he, he sets up everything with his shot. His shot, if you give him any airspace, it's good. And he'll shoot it from four feet beyond the three. You've got to be ready at all times. Smitty, uh, second half was quiet for CJ. In the last game, they're going to win on the road. How much does it come down to? Okay, this question of not having a third guy is going to continue, but we got to have the two guys at least if we're going to win a game here in Oklahoma City. Yeah, and the reason why I love CJ is not just because it's scoring. He's a guy that can break you down and get his feet in the paint. They don't do it too much on the post up, but I would love to see CJ when he's going offensively. Yes, to keep scoring, but I, I just think his ability to be able to break you down and get in the paint to get some other guys easy shots. Dame is doing that better. Both of those guys, because they have the ball so much, make sure I'm getting you an open shot. Those two guys can get their shot when they want to. And I think CJ, when he comes in and he had, he's with Seth Curry, get Seth some open shots because both of those guys can get to create their own shots at any time. You need your teammates at times. They're not traditional point guards, but I think if both those guys can do that a little bit more and defensively. I mean, they held them to 39% OKC, went up to 40, but it was 48% shooting for OKC last 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 game, and I know they're at home, some kind of way Portland has to get back to defensively and making this a slower pace game. And Seth had one attempt from three and didn't make you gotta give him more opportunities. Let's talk about Paul George, because we know he's not the same version. He said, Karan, hey look, I'm feeling better, I'll be fine, I'll shoot better. But I know you like the other things you see him doing in terms of ways he can impact the game, including getting to the basket a little more if the shot's not going to be there from three. That's why he's a huge asset to this ball club because not only from a scoring standpoint, but defensively, he's able to switch out on Dame and CJ McCollum and take guys out like that out of the game and still utilize his versatility and be a facilitator on the offensive end of the floor. You see him in position where he's able to get his feet in the paint, be aggressive, you know, put the pressure on the defense of the Portland Trail Blazers and get them in foul troubles, get them in the bonus early. But he's also able to offset a lot of the things that they have going from an offensive standpoint because if he's out there, whether he's in a chair, whether he's half injured or whatever, you have to respect the presence of Paul George. And the presence of the supporting cast, we know it's easier for the others at home, but Jeremy Grant, Schroeder, others, mm-hmm. their best game of the series in Game 3. You know who else had that? Uh, Kevin Durant had uh, his. In case you weren't <laughs> sure, he's Kevin Durant. Uh, not that. that Pat Bev didn't know that. He also knew how tall he was. When we come back, we'll get a chance to have Chris Ledlow join us, get her thoughts and takes from out at Staples, and how the Clips can get back in this thing. We'll talk about the dominance from KD as Golden State looks to take a commanding lead in this series.